Welcome once again to the Club Room brought to you by Win Again. Again, my name is Mark Moyer. I'm super excited to have three fantastic individuals. Um, all three are Olympians, and I learned many moons ago that no one's a former Olympian. You are an Olympian for life, and I think that's pretty damn cool. Leah Miko, oh my gosh, what an amazing career she's had uh, in the sport of softball. You know, she was uh, born uh, near, uh, well, she was born in Southern California and uh, was an All American in college, three years won uh, the NCAA championships at Arizona, pretty damn incredible. Um, and then she um, became a member of three Olympic teams, won three gold medals. Um, is uh, She also has like a, for Team USA, like a, a, I believe it's a lifetime average of somewhere around you know, 340 or something, a slugging percentage of 450. And that's Hall of Fame numbers, an incredible uh, lefty hitting outfielder, but just um, also an incredibly warm person. How was that intro? I'm sure it was fantastic. Anyway, rolling my eyes. Um, yes, it was like, great. What the hell? It okay. was great. Yes. But I, yes, I was on all those teams. I just, my path though was getting to college as a pitcher and my second year coach being like, well, we don't need you to pitch anymore, but you're going to learn the outfield. And then that's actually two years after that. I went from not even knowing what I was doing out there to being on Team USA. So, um, and then I finished my career at Arizona and on Team USA um, at first base. So I'm all about flexibility, versatility. And if you do things hey, great, they'll find a place. No there. sales pitch right now, please, ma'am. Hold <laughs> off one second. Good I'm kidding you. around. <laughs> By the way, that reminds me, I, I know I got to get you guys in here. Sorry, hang on a second, gentlemen. Um, but uh, it reminds me of when I was, uh, I was a drummer in like grade school. And then when I went to middle school, they had too many drummers. So they lined up all the drummers. And the guy said, you, 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 and you, you're no longer playing drums. We're like, what? They said, you're playing trombone. I'm like, trombone? What the, what's a trombone? And they're like, mm, here you go. And I was like, so I know what you're talking about, pivot. That was a big pivot. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Um, up next, uh, Ruben Gonzalez. I've known Ruben for a few years. I can have, I can safely say that he has introduced me to some amazing, amazing people, including you, Leah. So, yeah. um, and Ruben, uh, what an amazing story. Oh, by the way, you know, I'm, should I show it now or once he comes in? I love this book and I don't say that about every book. I really don't. I think a lot of them suck, but this one's really good. Um, and he's, he's written about 75 books. Uh, you can check, not really, but he's written a bunch of books. And you can see um, if you click on the logo on the left, we put a couple of books over there. Click on that and you get access to it. Go to his um, website or Amazon and just buy a bunch of them because they're really good. Um, but on top of that, here's a gentleman who emigrated from Argentina. He was born down there, uh, way down there, and uh, came to the States. He has an incredible story. I don't want to ruin it because it's in the book and stuff like that. But I'll skip ahead to the point where he... he um, participated in four separate Winter Olympics in four different decades, which is really incredible as he's um, only 17 years old right now. But um, but he's managed to, I don't know, cryogenically preserve himself or something, but um, absolutely amazing. And um, plus, I, he's a fantastic guy. So come on in, Ruben, and uh, we'll uh, get you cranking up. I don't even know how I did with that intro, but he's in Colorado Springs wow, right now. Cool. Oh, no, not right now, actually. You're in where, no, actually, from, the, the, from the point where, where, where you put, picked up the book. I thought it was a great intro. This is an amazing book. It still is an amazing book. It hasn't changed. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Uh, thanks. Awesome. So what do you ask? I don't know. I'm in Colorado Springs. Yeah, that's where I live. Yeah, okay, cool. And then lastly, um, and I'm going, not lastly, because that sounds horrible, um, but Darren, Darren Steele, what a super guy. Um, I met him about a year or so ago. Um, as, a, as a really impressive background, this guy, was a decathlete and not just a bad one. I mean, a very good one in college. And people say, wait a minute, decathlon to the bobsled, how does that happen? Well, it happens because you gotta be a pretty freaking good athlete to be not just a loser, Ruben as, Ruben, as you know, but also, I mean, look, to be an Olympian in general, you need to be super athletic. And um, went to uh, Eastern Illinois, uh, won a whole bunch of medals and, and uh, um, just really was an incredible uh, athlete, still is, I'm sure, um, but uh, is also was the CEO of the uh, the uh, USA Bobsled and Skeleton, uh, and then more recently now is the VP of the International Bobsled and Skeleton Federation. I hope I said that okay. Um, Darren is also in the corporate world right now. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's, this is fantastic. I mean, look, I'm excited because to me, 
I love, uh, I think most Americans and most people globally love the Olympics because here, mm -hmm. here it's a stage where these are, you know, everyone is trained, 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 trained like crazy for what could be just a short, a short, a really short visit, especially when you're talking about sports that, you know, you have just a few heats and then it's on, mm -hmm. right? Um, game on. And uh, I'm going to start my first question. I'm going to actually target towards Darren. Um, Darren, what I, I need to know something because I don't want to dwell too much on the career part of it, but I do. I just have to know what on earth got you into a bobsled? Well, uh, the thing about bobsled is that um, I, th I think it's one of the unique things and one of the reasons most bobsledders that you find uh, are pretty humble. And and the reason is it's because you probably failed at some other sport before you were turned on to, uh, to bobsled. And, you know, essentially you, you realize I'm in the best shape of my life. Uh, I do and that uh, I still have a dream of competing, still have a dream of the games, and maybe I've got what it takes to bobsled. And so you, you, know, you sort of identify yourself um, as a potential bobsled athlete before you try it. And so um, that was my route. I was I was invited to uh, to try out by uh, an athlete I met at a photo shoot for the Army's program, and I was doing track and field decathlon, and he said, "Hey." Uh, you should come push me in a bobsled. And he was waiting around when I failed to make the 96 um, for track and field and said, uh, all right, you ready? And didn't really have a great plan B. And so I thought, let me see if uh, I'm gonna enjoy that. And so, you know, it took a little while to fall in love with it. You know, you, it's hard to love it if you don't work at it, but you know, once you put the time in, you know, you, uh, you definitely, uh find that passion for it uh for most of us and um yeah the rest is history but i but i need to know something look i think most of us who watch whether it's the luge or the skeleton or the bobsled and any but any kid who's ever sledded down a hill there's no greater joy i mean that's the hurtling down on a on a little piece of plastic where you know every single turn is death defying <clears throat> And you can whack into a tree, a car, or whatever it is—a rock doesn't matter. There's no like adrenaline, such an adrenaline rush that when you say you had to get used to it and get. Um, so tell people in, in in one word or less, but like okay. bobsled is not necessarily just sitting on a plastic thing going down a hill. It's it's messed up. It's a tough if it's a tough sport. Give us a sense of you know what. I mean, at what point did you really start like actually saying, wow, this is fun. This is great. Or was it always like, oh, shit, you know? So my first 25 trips, I was pretty sure I was going to die. <laughs> um, glad I didn't. And then uh, it was, you know, get a little bit enjoyable. See, the problem is, you know, when you're in the back, you have no control. And so you're at the mercy of the, the driver. Um, and I, it was that first track was really difficult in Latvia, um, really rough track. And so when I got to Winterberg for the second track, uh, that's really smooth. And I, I felt the difference. And that was the first time I, I really enjoyed the trip. But when when people say, depends on who's driving, sometimes it's fun. Um, sometimes it's not. But it, it's surprising to most people the first time they do it because it's, it's violent. Uh, it's loud. You're getting knocked around. Um, it's it's fun for maybe the first third, and then you're going, you know, really fast. And uh, you know, you realize if we were to crash now, it would hurt a lot. Um, and so, it's a you know, it, it's a sport. So yeah, it's it's fun as a passenger, but we're not really passengers when we're competing. We're thinking about where we are on the track and racing for you know hard g curves um and you know feeling our way down if if this is going to be a fast run or not how the how's the pilot doing so a lot of thoughts in your mind other than you know hey this is really fun i appreciate you sharing that um and i have to then slide over to ruben slide over interesting pun um now ruben you you know I love the story of, and I, I won't ruin it completely, but just how you were thinking, well, what would be my, you were inspired by the 1980 Olympics and you were thinking, well, 
how can I be an Olympian? What would be the, I don't want to say the easiest way to it, but the, I don't know, is that the right term, easiest, but the, the best way towards it? And look where it's taking you. It's amazing. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, well, when I was 10 years old, I saw the Olympics for the first time, uh, the Sapporo Games, 72. Mm-hmm. And I was hooked. I knew that's what I want to do. But um, but I didn't believe it was possible because I was always the last kid picked for PE, right? I'm not, like I said, I'm not a great athlete. And so I didn't, I didn't pursue it. And it wasn't until 1984, I'm watching the Sarajevo games on TV, and I see Scott Hamilton win the gold medal. And he's about five foot one, and I thought, man, if that little guy can win, I can at least play. I'm going to be in the next ones no matter what. I just have to find a sport. And my, my strength was always tenacity. So I started looking for, for sports that fit my strength. And I headed down to ski jump, bobsled, and luge. I uh, lived in Houston, so, um, you know, I, for, if I never skied before. That would have been suicide, so that one was out. Bobsled, you know, where are you going to find three other nuts in Houston wanting to do the bobsled, right? Luge, I could do by myself. And so so um, I didn't even know where the track was, and I wrote Sports Illustrated a letter. I asked them, where do you go learn how to luge? They said Lake Placid, and I called them up, and I told them I want to learn how to luge. So I'm in the Olympics in four years. Will you help me? And the guy asked me how old I was. And when I told him I was 21, he started laughing. He says, no way, man, you're too old. We start them off, they're 10 years old. And I knew if I hung up the phone, it was all over. So I just kept talking to him. And finally, I guess I wore him down. <laughs> he said, we've got a beginner's camp coming up in a few weeks. Be there. And so I went. And But he didn't candy coat it. He, and I'm glad he didn't. He tried to talk me out of it. He says, you're going to break bones. You know, if you want to do it at your age, in just four years, it's brutal. And... Uh, when I hung up, it got me thinking. I thought, hmm, sounds like this could be tough. And he says, I will break bones. You know, well, well what am I going to do when I break a bone? And I thought, you know, I've broken bones before. <laughs> you wear a cast for six weeks, then you take it off, and it's healed up, and it's stronger than before. So it's really a temporary inconvenience. And so I reframed it, and and, uh, and it helped me prepare mentally, right, for, for the battle ahead. And so I went. They put me in this class with 15 other guys, and they're quitting because they got bruises, right? I guess they didn't. They thought it was going to be easy. Oh, laying down, downhill, doesn't get any better than that, right? <laughs> but uh, but I, you know, I I prepared mentally for it. I knew it was going to be tough, and that helped me. That along with the desire, right? And so the you, you <coughs> held up the book, The Courage to Succeed. I believe you have, no matter what your your dream is, you have to have two types of courage. you got to have the courage to get started, the courage to not quit. The courage to get started, that comes from believing it's it's possible. Right. But I didn't believe it was possible. So I, it took me 10 years to get that belief. The courage to not quit, that comes from your desire. If you want something badly enough, you know, ain't nothing to make you quit. Right. And so I always had the desire. It took me a while to get the belief. But once I had that belief, I was ready to take action. And so so that's in a nutshell, you know, my, my crazy story. And it is. And it's, uh, you know, I highly recommend the book. I, I haven't read all of your books yet. I'm sorry, Ruben. I hope I'm not. Uh fired for that offense but um but, the, but this one was phenomenal it really was good so um leah i'm, I'm out of here forget it <laughs> again dang it um <laughs> leah so in your case a little bit different you decided not to choose the cold weather type sport um mostly because they weren't offered where you are but um but tell me a little bit about uh you know when you first found out, because you were, from what I remember, I think you, you were the only collegiate player to be chosen on your Olympic team. Is that correct? No, no, there oh, were a couple one? of us. Oh, there, there, were, were, okay. there, there were three of us in college, and actually one high school, one high school player. She was no a kidding! Senior. Wow, wow. Yeah, and um, then everybody else was older. Now, did you have a for your first one? Did you have a feeling that that you were in, or was it touch and go, or what do you think? Well, you know, it was the first time softball was ever in the Olympic Games. And there were a lot yeah. of these women who had put their lives on hold, really. Some of them, I mean, you know, in their late 20s, living with mom and dad so they could train and try to make that one, you know, national team each summer. And then now, obviously, the Olympic team. And I just remember being at the tryout and I was with, you know, there were over 50 women from of all ages and a lot with men, much more experience than I had. And I remember hearing one of the the older veterans saying, you know, this, this Olympics right here is for the the older athletes, like those younger girls, they'll all have a chance later. And I knew I fit in that younger oh. category. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just remember literally that was it, right before the trial started. And I was like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to prove that age does not matter, that I can be on that team. And I just, I am a huge, um, 
believer in that, like Ruben was talking about, that passion and that belief, because I really believe that I there were probably more talented athletes than myself. Um, but I think the fact that I was versatile, I think um, a lot of the intangibles and things that have to do with choice, but ultimately, like I 100% believed and, and I was just the type of player, like if I had that doubt, there's no way I'm an Olympian because again, the, a lot of the athletes are faster and stronger than I was, uh, but I was very consistent. That's another big uh, word for me is to consistently show up every single day. And I truly believe that I, I would outwork a lot of them. You know, obviously my teammates work extremely hard, but for me, like I was never going to skip one workout and I was going to probably do all the extra things. So Leah, tell me a little bit about you know, you're at the games, but were you, uh, and I don't know the answer to this, were you able to either march in the opening ceremonies or the closing, or was it just strictly straight to the field, or what was it like for you? Yeah, I was able to march in the opening ceremonies, but we were actually in Columbus, Georgia, so we really went into Atlanta just to experience that, and then kind of went back to Fort Benning, and where we stayed where softball was just at its own, you know, village that it had. Um, mm -hmm. So that was amazing to me because I actually was like, oh my gosh, you can actually meet these other athletes. You see everybody from around the world. Again, I was a college student, so I, I was trying to get as many pictures as I could and trade pins with every athlete from, <laughs> from all over. Um, so that was the first Olympic experience for me. That's amazing, Darren. Yeah, it was, um, I, I soaked everything in opening, closing, um, in the village. And it was like, I mean, it was, it was just amazing just seeing athletes. And, and one of the cool things was, um, it's easy to take what you do for granted. Um, but there's so much respect for, for the other athletes and, and what they are doing and it's, it's mutual. And so it's just a great atmosphere where everybody's just in awe of one another um, and, you know, understanding that this is a magical experience, you know, that's only going to be a short period of time that we really have to enjoy it. Um, and so, you know, lots of pictures and, and uh, uh, but it was an unbelievable experience. And that opening ceremony is, I mean, walking into the stadium and the place erupts and, and that's really where most of us felt the gravity of wearing USA on on your uniform and representing your country. And you know that the yeah, it's 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 pressure, but it's it's welcome pressure. But it's uh, but it's incredibly humbling to uh, to to take that in and, and realize, all right, they're they're sending me to represent, and that's uh, got to deliver. But it's 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 a big moment and the opening. That's, that's amazing. That's true. Rip, how about you, Ruben? What was it like for the first time you walked in? Uh, the first one was Calgary in 88. And uh, Calgarians are very, very friendly. Um, and it's similar to Houston, you know, it's cowboys and oil. So I felt like I was at home. And uh, they'd been wanting to get the Olympics for about 20 years. And they kept getting passed over by other cities. And when they got it, it was, the, 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 they were so ecstatic. So that coupled with the fact that it was the first one was, was incredible. And, uh, and like Darren said, you know, you're just trying to soak every moment. You're trying to, uh, we have the best, men's luge has the best schedule. Uh, we're always the day after opening ceremonies. The first day after opening ceremonies is the first two runs and the next day. So, so right now in Beijing, everybody's taking their training runs. And then on, uh, on Saturday, uh, they'll take the men will take the first two runs and then the Sunday the last two and then you're done right and that's party time watch everybody else sweat because there's no there's no more no more pressure and you can really enjoy it plus we get to come in a little bit earlier so we get to meet everybody we're in some so it's uh, it's sweet we we're very fortunate that way the amazing thing about um, you know performing for I mean there's that pressure from wearing the flag as you say and, and representing the country. But it's also really, I'm sure it was amazing to, you know, you meeting, let's say the the Swedish guy that or the Norwegian ski jumper or something, and you're saying, how the hell do you do that? Are you crazy? And then he's saying, well, how the hell do you haul ass down an icy slope down? You know, whatever it is. <laughs> so there's there's so much of that, I'm sure, right? Um, but you know, when when all is said and done, I mean, you all three of you are are elite at the sports, and that's what brought you to the games and so forth. Um, did you, um, this is something I'm a little curious about. 
when you spoke to other athletes from different countries, was there any um, kind of like, what's it like to live in America? What's it like to live in Czechoslovakia or whatever? What's it like to, um, you know, was there politics and any of that stuff or was it just, you're just talking about the games itself? You know, Darren, what was, what was your experience with that? Um, the really, I don't re remember, at least in, in my circle, uh, much conversation like that. Cause you have to remember, um, we've got world cup competitions, you know, every year. And so for, you know, for the athletes we compete with, um, and against those conversations may have happened on, on tour, but it wasn't, it wasn't the novelty that, that you might being at the games, it, those, those conversations would take place with other sports that you weren't that familiar with. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure they have, they took place in, in terms of uh, asking about, you know, the different nations and, and, and things like that. But um, that, that wasn't so much my recollection that the language barrier did prevent, I think, some of those conversations. And so, you know, you tended to spend more time with the, uh, those who share a common language. And so, uh, you know, there wasn't as much, I guess, novelty or mystery around those nations. Um, so that, that, I mean, that's, that's my experience. And I, I certainly wasn't uh, everywhere in the village. Well, I don't want to like um, suggest how um, long ago they may have been when you were there, but it was before the world of Google where you could say, you know, <laughs> you know, Google translate, whatever the hell it was. Right. Um, yeah. And then, so uh, Leah, did you, um, cause you mentioned you were off in the, uh, the separate sort of village, right. But you obviously had a chance to chat with some of the other teams, right. Or what was it? Yeah, what was well, that like? especially the other Olympics. I went to 2000, 2004. So we were in the mm -hmm. village and okay, um, good. and so, yeah, we got to meet a lot of athletes. I remember the cafeteria usually was the meetup place. <laughs> so we'd be sitting with people from all over. And then even for us, it was really fun meeting other um, Andy Roddick we hung out with. He did. He missed opening ceremonies and we're like, we're not allowed to go. This is in Athens. So we're like, hang out with us, you know. <laughs> so for us, we thought it was fun that, you know, this guy that makes millions in America, you know, is hanging out with us. So, um, but yeah, we would meet people from other countries. And I feel like, you know, for us, a lot of it was just kind of like learning about their culture a little bit more so. And I do remember being at the Olympic, that the opening ceremony is probably in Sydney and how almost everybody I felt like just wanted to get pictures with the Americans, obviously basketball, but they wanted just in general, like America was the draw. And you'd hear these stories of just what these other people like come through and how they even reach this. But for us, we literally have every opportunity in front of us. And so that's something that kind of imprinted me at a young age, you know, my first Olympics being 21 and just the realization of how truly blessed with opportunity we are, we are in America. Oh, nicely stated. All right. Thank you. And uh, Ruben, tell me about your experience with that. You know, when I got started, I started sliding back in 84. So this is uh, the first time we went to Segulda. It was part of Russia. We would fly into Moscow and then take a train or fly over to Segulda in Latvia. And so, and, and the and DDR, right? Uh, the, the East Germans were trained uh, back then. And so, um, yeah, we didn't talk too much with them because of the language barrier, like, like Darren was saying. But I remember that the East Germans and especially the Russians, they would come to the States and they would eat fruit like 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 no tomorrow, right? Because they didn't get fruit. They might get a banana every six months in, in Russia, right? And so wow. they were just eating fruit. They wouldn't eat anything else. Mm -hmm. And then I remember one time in Lake Placid, we had a World Cup race there just before the came down and there was always a couple of guys you know and and overcoats that were always around the athletes and then i asked somebody you know who are those guys it's kgb they want to make sure they don't defect so it was, it was really you know, crazy that way um as far as meeting people i remember at the alberville olympics they had us all just like you Leah, i mean they, they had us in a separate village it was, a, it was this hotel it was just all the bobslayers and the losers were there this is before they had skeleton and herschel was pushing for the U.S., so I got I got to meet Herschel Walker. We got our picture with him, and he's 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 my height, but he's built like a tank, right? And the whole time you could hardly talk to Herschel. I mean, he was a cool guy, but he, but he's always on the phone because he was playing for the Washington Generals and he was renegotiating his contract. And so it was uh, neat to see, you know, the the rich guy, right? Kind of like Leah said yeah. about Roddick. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's that's really awesome. So um, before we go much further, there's one question that Matt had, and I'll I'll ask each of you. I know a couple of you commented already in the in the chat box, but um, I'll start with you, Leah. You know, aside from softball, what is your favorite? Do you have a favorite Olympic sport that when it's on, you're transfixed, whether it's winter oh. or summer? Well, for me, like at the time, I grew up playing softball and soccer and absolutely loved both. And I was going to actually try for my fifth year to play soccer at Arizona, but I redshirted for the Olympics, so that didn't happen. So women's soccer at the time, that was so fun for us to be there when they were just coming off of the World Cup yeah. win and they were huge at the Olympics. And, you know, we rode the, you know, the bus transportation over to opening ceremonies with them. And so, and I know soccer, they move around a lot more, so they were only in and out. But um for me and then we actually got to go to you know the final game we also went to the final um baseball game and that was we kind of got to know tom lewis sort a little bit in sydney and they won the gold um so i would say probably the women's soccer team though for me because it was a little more personal in that sense oh that's great how about you darren well um if we're talking about while we're competing uh so winter olympics um love the speed skating and the ice skating and, and ice dancing um still uh, i will watch a middle school track meet between two country schools if it's on <laughs> just because I, I love the sport so much <laughs> well as a decathlete you loved 10 sports so much i guess right or 10 10 uh, disciplines i guess it is right or sports i guess they are all sports right and how about you ruben I love track and field. Always have. I mean, maybe it's because I'm a slow folk that I have, you know, uh, I'm so amazed to see these people run and jump and, uh, you know, pure athleticism just blows me away. So I'm a soccer fanatic being from Argentina. In fact, today Argentina's playing Colombia and I got to find myself. <laughs> <laughs> but in the Winter Olympics, uh, I think the what excites me the most is the four man Bob start. When you got four guys and these guys are big, strong. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, at the start, all of them yelling, there's so much adrenaline and power that it's just, it fires you up. That's really cool. You know, it's funny is they recently they've added, not re I don't know how recently, but you know, some of these action sports that like, they seem like they're X, you know, X games type things where you've got the, mm -hmm. like the, the five guys hurtling down the hill on their, on their, uh, you know, snowboards or whatever, all like oh, all jockeying so around each other and stuff, or yeah. you know, uh, or even the the um, in the velodrome with the the bicycle, all all like right next to each other, like it's a little NASCAR race and stuff. So I mean, there's there's some <laughs> really interesting sports like that, but that's great. All right, so listen, I, I want to have a chance for everybody to be able to chat with you a little bit more. So I'm going to ask one more question, um, or one and a half kind of more questions, and then. I guess what I, you know, right now uh, we're about to launch into the uh, the Beijing Olympics in the next few days. Um, and there's been obviously a fair amount of controversy. I mean, a lot of it. And, you know, I, I chatted earlier today uh, with Leah about this, but it's something I'd love to hear each of you talk about a little bit is, you know, um, I feel like there's there's typically issues going to almost any games. Someone's upset with somebody else. A country's upset with how other countries do stuff, whatever it might be. In your opinion, you know, and Darren, I want to start with you. I mean, do you feel that, I mean, as an athlete, do you focus on some of that political stuff or do you just kind of say, look, I'm here to kick, you know, kick someone else's ass. I got to focus, laser focus on hauling ass down the mountain. I don't care if U.S. and Russia and this and that and China, whatever it is, or do you, or do you pay attention to some of that? Well, I mean, part of this is probably going to be generational because I think today's athletes are, are probably different in, in some regard um, than to what we went through. But for us, it was um, it was certainly the, the latter. You are it's so big and you've waited for this moment mm -hmm. for so long, trained. And so it's it's almost odd when you do hear bits and pieces about these other things happening in the world, um, because, you know, your only focus really is is what's going on at the games, and and I and one thing that uh, that I did notice that maybe speaks to this is um, as we're experiencing you know the games and, and and going through it, and and it's you know just an amazing daily experience. Um, when when we would see references to the medal count, it it seemed really odd that like wh why why 
is anybody keeping track of that? That has nothing to do with the spirit of the games that we're, mm -hmm. that we're living. And it just, it seemed like, um, you know, very different than what we were experiencing a, a focus on that. So uh, for whatever that's worth, um, uh, but, but certainly it's, it's big enough that we didn't look too much outside of what was happening in the village. Okay, cool. How about you, Leah? What do you think? Yeah, I would say during that time, <laughs> you're so focused on the sport. <laughs> that That yeah. is it. I would say maybe I had a teammate, um, you know, that was like really interested in all of it and had always the news. I will say I found it a little more interesting that I kind of felt like there was a little more division within the American um, group about, well, when I remember when I was competing, George Bush was the president and one of the you know, players on another team in America was mad at any players who wanted to um, go to the White House during that time. How could you? And so I mm. thought, wow, this is so interesting. And I could not believe somebody on a team could treat teammates like that because they had a different view. To me, that was the beauty of our team. We had all different views. We had very big conversations. But the reality was at the end of the day, we respected each other's opinions and we loved each other and we had a goal. And so I was just that to me was very interesting. Um, I would say afterwards I got more involved, but I agree with Darren, like you train so long and so hard for this opportunity that is so short and so quick. And I feel like as an athlete, that is your full focus more than anything else. And so I think when I do hear of some of these athletes who maybe have a very, very strong opinion, I know it has to be such a core value. And I do respect that as well, because to me, like I know how deeply the other stuff matters. And so that's all I would say about it is I think it's kind of an individual thing. And I do respect kind of where anyone's coming from. Excellent answer. You should run for office or something like that. <laughs> I got my vote, although I can't vote in California yet. Someday, <laughs> or just move here to New York, and I'll vote for you here. Um, Ruben, tell me a little bit about your 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 thoughts on that. I I totally agree. I mean, we're we're there to get a job done. You know, you've been preparing for years, and you can't let anything get in your head. Um, in, in Vancouver, you know, we had somebody fly off the track and die the day before our race, and and we'd never seen. You know, I was there when it happened. First thought in my mind was, you know, I can't, I didn't know you could fly of a truck. I didn't know that was possible. And then the next thought was that could have been me. Yeah. And, and, uh, and this is the couple of hours before the opening ceremonies. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, Nodar's family, but, uh, for a couple of hours, you know, they were, I'm trying to process, do I even compete tomorrow? You know, is that disrespecting Nodar? Right. And then, we all talked about it. A bunch of us did, and we realized, you know, no, no, we 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 have to do it because he gave his life for this. So we have to do our best, you know. And this is our chance to honor him. And so even something as uh, awful as that, you know, uh, you 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 go back to you know getting the job done. You know, fo focus on what you you came there to do. Absolutely. You know, and I, and I, I get the feeling that, and you know, in tying all this together, that. Um, Virtually every athlete feels that way. I mean, you're, you know, you're when you're training for this sport day in and day out, and it's grueling, and it's and it's blood, sweat, and tears, and everything. You know, you may read the news about whatever it is, but you know, you're just as you said, if if the if you're being if you're going, you're being sent, you're representing your country. Um, you're going to do the best you can, and you know, I think that there's a in and uh, I think many people can attest to this. Also, um, you're right, Darren, to the extent that sometimes there's a maybe an over-focus on gold, silver, bronze kind of thing. Everybody wants to be gold, medal, silver, and on the podium and so forth. But there are thousands of athletes that are not necessarily winning a medal, but they're there because they are they're the top, top whatever in the world. I mean, this is what they, they're, they're incredible. And I think there should be, a, and I think there is a, a pretty good focus on how good, especially within the sport itself, on how good you all are. Um, I think, though, on the flip side, Darren, we all keep score of kind of everything. So I, I guess I understand that the whole concept of medal count and it increases the competitive nature of, of the Olympics for the outsiders, I suppose. Um, but that, but listen, I really appreciate you all being here. Before we jump, um, if you could tell me, and I'll start with you, Darren, um, number one, how people can get in touch with you. Um, and tell me a little bit about, you know, maybe some of the things that you'd love to learn from some other people, if you could. 
Um, so anyone can get me on, on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me there and, and message me. Um, and you know what, uh, what I'd love to learn. I, I'm always interested in people's stories. I think everybody unique. Um, and you know, from competing in the games to, you know, life today, um, might seem, you know, mundane, um, which is probably why it's a challenge, but, but, but that transition can as, as you know, Mark, you've, you've spent a lot of time focused on that. And I'm always just curious as what, uh, what was that like for you? And how did, how did the experience as an athlete, um, help you in that process and being successful afterwards? And also how did it, how did it hinder you and patients and blind spots? Um, because, you know, we do help people going through that. Um, and so I'm, I'm always interested in, in, in learning how people have navigated it. That's great. Awesome. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Uh, Leah yourself. Yes, I'm also on LinkedIn as well. Um, and I already connected with a few people on this call <laughs> was looking yes. you guys up. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of feel the same as Darren for me. Like, I just think, um, just connections with people in general, whether it's we do something similar. I love learning. Ruben has been awesome. I met him at an event and then I had some questions for him last year and um, just love everything you shared with me because I think we can always get better. And I, you know, it's a beautiful thing. We all have our own strengths, but I think we can always learn from others. So for me, I just love hearing what other people do. And then, you know, obviously I think God always has a purpose when people meet, it could just be to encourage somebody um, or it could be, Hey, collaboration. And there's something that fits here. So that's, you know, that's kind of my mindset coming in here and, and really looking forward to meet, meet all of you. That's great. Thanks so much. And, and Ruben? Something that always intrigued me was what makes successful people tick? You know, what did they do? How did they think differently? Uh, what mindset led to that? And I think that's why uh, you and I, uh, Mark, well, while we connected and kind of hit it off because uh, the, the work you do with athletes transition, it's uh, kind of dovetailed, right? It's similar. And um, that just, uh, you know, that personal development stuff really you know, uh, gets me pumped up, right? And uh, how can people chase you down? Oh, uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well. And uh, my website is thelugeman.com. Thelugeman.com. The Iceman was taken. It would have been so much easier. But hey, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, every two years or so, I get this call. Somebody's looking for lug nuts, right? Oh, this is a lug man? No, luge man. I don't do oh, lug nuts. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> no that's no response. <laughs> That is hilarious. Hey, listen, one last question. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple of uh, folks here that also were uh, Olympians, are Olympians. Uh, and Ryan LaVarnway, uh, major league baseball player, he was asking, did you guys trade pins at the Olympics? And if you did, you know, what did you do that with them afterwards? Where are they now? How about, I'll start with Darren. Absolutely, traded pins all the time. Um, yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. Traded clothing, pins, anything. and. Um, I've got, I've got boxes of Olympic stuff. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to say it's on a great display, but, um, you know, I've got some things on display, but my pins are in a, in a big, a big bag in, uh, in one of those boxes. Darren, by the way, I've, I've seen your, I've seen the mannequin. <laughs> And the mannequin, when we've spoken, that's a, to me a tad disturbing. But tell me a little bit about the mannequin. We don't talk about that, Mark. Um, uh, it was a um, Under Armour, you know, made the suit for uh, for the bobsled team for the U.S. And um, their first prototype, uh, I've got that in my office with the original prototype speed suit. Um, and interesting story around that that particular speed suit is different than what you saw at the games in 2010 because i said i didn't like one aspect of it and it was kevin plank's design that part and uh you know ceo founder of Under armor and um i i didn't realize that um but i i 
you know, I drew a line in the sand because the, the athletes didn't like it either. And so they changed it. And um, I don't know that he's ever forgiven me for that, but he was not happy that we uh, made him change it. My, hu my husband works that. That. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> there have been some pretty hideous, by the way, Olympic uh, outfits uh, that, that we, uh, uniforms, et cetera. So I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure he actually has forgiven you by now, maybe. Um, so that's great. How about you, Leah? Uh, pins and, and that sort of thing. Um, yes, we did trade them, but I, I said, I don't know where they are, but I bet you anything they are in my Olympic box. <laughs> <laughs> Go check it out. <laughs> it's just uh, a box of old gloves and helmets and all my USA gear and jackets and everything. And my rings are in my safe, but my, <laughs> but my <laughs> yeah. pins, I think they're just in the box. <laughs> Wait a minute. You said, you said the rings, you mean, what are, where are the medals? Is that what you meant? The medals, medals are in the safe? Well, the medals I have there too, but yes, we got Olympic rings as well, but yes, I have my medals. I'm going to run and get them and I'm going to hold them up one second. Not that you have, you guys have Ooh. all seen. No, go for it. Go. Can we do it? Yeah, okay. yeah five, four, three, five. hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, good. And Ruben, where, <laughs> Where's your oh lens? yeah, I, I've got my pins. No, no, I I, I got them. I framed them. I've got oh, yeah? frames for all four Olympics, and uh, not only NOC pins, right? National Olympic Committee pins. I don't have Visa, Mastercard, all those. All the people that didn't sponsor me, they don't get displayed, right? But uh, right. NOC pins, yeah. And um, and I've got four Olympic torches at home because I got to carry the torch. No and then kidding. I, I, I wow. go to eBay and I can't hold back. Yeah, I got an Olympic museum at home. So when, when you don't have medals, you just buy stuff at eBay, Leah. <laughs> but no, <Jesus>. but. <laughs> Seems a little no, but cheating. Uh, but no, 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 no. Oh, that's all awesome. Awesome. I love it. Well, wait, where? Um, I'm sorry. We can't really see those. Can you? Um, no, but yes, you can. Mail oh. you can. There we go. Oh, right there. Oh, yeah. Look at that. And we're going to take a look at that. Hang on a second. Put those there. Okay. There you go. Nicely done. Oh, um, man, but anyways, that. so uh, so um, thanks so much, everybody, hey, for being here. You want here. me to tell you, to, yeah. tell you something really quick about the medals? Yeah. Yeah, not, yeah. not Leah's medals, my, my non-medals. Yeah, let me oh, tell yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. You, you do a Q&A after speaking, right? Yeah. And almost every time somebody asks, and it's like they weren't listening, right? They asked, did you win a medal? And, and I got, I do, I do. I mean, and, and I do like, oh, oh man, everybody has to ask me that, right? I do this dramatic thing. But I tell yeah. them, look, you know what? I always wanted to beat Pablo. Pablo Garcia from Spain, he was always about five sleds in front of me. And if I beat Pablo, that was my gold medal, right? And now Pablo, he was, at, he was gunning for the Swede. If he won, if he beat the Swede, going after this check the check goes after an italian and the italian is going after the german right german, so there's yep. all of these pride races going on within the whole thing so uh, i just wanted to be pablo i mean that, that, that was it for me i like that Wait, that's your next book title i just want to be pablo <laughs> i want to be pablo <laughs> beat pablo <laughs> we're best friends no i don't want to beat him that way all right <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, well, all of you, thank you so much. We're going to bounce back to the tables in a sec, but I really appreciate you sharing your time and your experiences. We're all pretty pumped that uh, the games are starting soon. I'm extremely excited. I love the Winter Games. Um, I mean, there's there's hardly a sport that I don't like to watch. It's they're they're all a blast. And Leah, don't worry, I like watching softball too, um, <laughs> and the other summer games. Um, but still, it's it's exciting. So I'm, I'm thanks so much for being here. I'll I'll make sure to introduce you to um, a couple of the other Olympians that are here. And uh, thanks again for sharing your time. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. Thanks. All right.